As the Rumor President, this is one of the most significant decisions you have to make. The Royal Gold Medal is one of the highest honours that we give to architects. It is uh, an award that the Royal Institute of British Architects gives on behalf of the reigning monarch, His Majesty the King, to an individual or a group who have advanced the delivery and of architecture in the UK and globally. We have an open call for students, for fellows, and members of the RIVA to submit nominations. And each year, the Honours Committee, chaired by the President, and this year by myself, um, deliberate, discuss in detail the merits of why a particular individual or group should be awarded this significant prize. Professor Loco has been awarded the Royal Gold Medal this year for her groundbreaking work as an educator, as a curator, and as an author. It is often difficult to acutely quantify the impact of an individual, and a single individual can rarely shape the thoughts, actions, and advancement of potentially hundreds of millions of people in how they live, how they work, the schools they attend, and how they use resources. However, in Professor Loco, with her progressive teaching methods to both present and future practitioners, as well as her transformative and influential leadership capabilities spanning well over 30 years and counting, we truly do have a once in a generation agent of change. What first sparked my interest in architecture? I think at a very deep level, um, I often think that I was searching for some place in the world that I could call home. My late father, who, who passed away 10 years ago, always used to say, um, he had this one phrase, pay it forward. And it, it took me a while to understand what he really meant by it. But I think that aspect of knowing that you stand on the shoulders of people behind you and that you, in some sense, will be a platform for other people is a really important part of the learning process and the kind of assimilation process for anybody coming from somewhere else. When Leslie was at school, she showed qualities which hinted at the success she has had in education. If you're an educator, you are basically a mentor for many, many students. And uh, even in her early days, she showed leadership and she showed uh, creativity and imagination. It's quite personal, and I think that's, that's hugely important. So personality and experience and history and identity all come, all have a, a role to play in it. So it's very important for me to, f to see that others see something of themselves in me. Leslie believes in inclusion as forefront to driving any meaningful discourse on architecture learn from my mentors as I did from my students. So there's been mentorship in many different ways and forms, and I would say it's, it's been a, a hugely important part of the way I work, partly because there wasn't an easily defined career path in front of me. It, it kind of had to be made. At the University of Westminster, Leslie established the Master of Arts program which evolved to become the MA Architecture, Cultural Identity and Globalization Programme. It is evident that the MA Programme at Westminster has been instrumental in shaping architectural discourse and the practice of so many of today's emerging practitioners, but it has critically um, helped to shape the establishment of multiple other related courses in the UK um, and around the world. In 2014-2015, in partnership with the University of Johannesburg, Professor Loco founded the Graduate School of Architecture, becoming its first director. At the time that she established the unit-based programme at the GSA, it is probably true to say that the world was very much still sleeping on the urgency and necessity to decolonise architectural curriculums. She developed structures and processes that allow the surfacing and valuing of indigenous knowledge systems 
many from the African continent, crossing themes of culture, identity, race and gender. Programs that focused on these issues became pivotal in shaping the evolution of contemporary city planning and urbanism. She curated a school that provided students and tutors alike with the freedom, the confidence and safe environments to express their ideas unbounded. Consequently, the school has become fertile ground for pioneering spatial and built environment ideas alongside architects and practitioners operating in multiple spatial environments both on the continent and internationally. It is already evident that the school's impact will be of a generational scale. What led me to publish White Papers Black Marks? I think the one sort of moment, the eureka moment, was seeing um, a copy of Francesca Hughes's The Architect Reconstructing Her Practice, which was the first, I think, edited book I'd seen, and it was a book that was specifically addressed to, to gender. And I remember thinking, oh, that's a great role model, it's a great template for trying to do something around ideas of race. I think I was also inspired by that Toni Morrison quote that if there is a book out there that you want to read that hasn't been written, you have to write it. And for me, it was very much a case of trying to put something in the world that articulated the way I felt about the issue of race and architecture. 23 years ago, when she edited White Papers, Black Marks, she was in the right place at the wrong time. I think I feel as though now she's in the right place at the right time. When people ask me, why did you start or how did it come about that the African Futures Institute started? And, and I always say, if you're going to do something that you've wanted to do for all your life, now is the moment to do it. She comes to Ghana and sets up the African Futures Institute with events which open doors for young not just architects, but people in the creative fields. And if you look at the breadth of her accomplishments and the very diverse areas that she's worked in, you see that this is a, a phenomenal woman. She went back to her home country of Ghana and set up the African Futures Institute to offer an alternative way of studying architecture. What I, I think her her biggest contribution has been is, is giving people confidence, giving people confidence to come to the table, to be part of the discussion, to say, here, come, we want to hear your voice, we want to hear from you. You will make the profession better. And nobody said that before. Um, and I, I think that's extraordinary. Leslie is one of those um, persons who could be anywhere in the world and be successful. For her to make the decision to set up here in Accra shows how deeply committed she was to the idea of bringing not just the country or Accra as a city, but then bringing the continent to light, to the forefront. The most powerful thing about the African Future Institute is that it talks about the future of African architecture in Africa. I think that through the AFI as a practice, or the AFI as an institute, um, Leslie has been able to give a lot of voice to a myriad of issues, but then also solutions that Africa as a continent holds, and the African diaspora as a concept um, also can bring. Decarbonisation and decolonisation are two sides of the same coin. And I mean that in a really epistemological way. I think it's easy to forget that the black body was unit, Europe's first unit of energy. So the relationship between exploitation and resources for, the, for those of us of African descent is a very direct um, relationship. It's, it's felt in the, skin, in the skin, so to speak. And I think that those who have an awareness of historically and experientially what it means to be exploited, have an awareness of resource management in a different way. So I think it's really important to allow, to encourage, to support those of us who, who have that innate understanding to explore 
what the relationship between building and exploitation and resources and rapacious growth means. Her ability to pull unexpected and often overlooked voices from all corners of the world created a rich tapestry of architectural discourse centered around decolonization and decarbonization from the very voices perhaps most impacted. Leslie's appointment as curator was not a surprise given the breadth and depth of work she's undertaken and the impact on a global stage that she's had. Having the, um, the Biennale was, was a really big moment. It was my first curatorship. Um, and so I think one of the wonderful things about architecture is that you kind of never know what's coming around the corner. When I was sitting at the opening of the Biennale, Leslie said something that really struck me. She said, the story of the architectural profession is not wrong, it's just incomplete. And I think Leslie has gone to great lengths to try to complete the story. Um, overriding hope I have from the Biennale, which was, you know, both a terrifying and an amazing experience kind of simultaneously, is we had a category, or I had a category in there called Guests from the Future, um, which were these 22 emerging practitioners from mostly from Africa and the, and the African diaspora. And my real hope is that one day, soon, they will become hosts. She centered black and, and minority groups in the conversation about how our architecture and architects can solve uh, big global problems. Leslie's uh, contribution to architecture over the past numerous years is that she's been pushing boundaries in, in terms of how architecture is discussed, researched um, and produced. Um, she has been uh, an advocate for democratizing architecture, making it accessible to all. That the term architect is protected in law, but the term architecture has no such legal protection. And it goes back to that relationship between the discipline and the profession and for the longest time I never thought of myself as having a practice. I think education is a form of practice, writing is a form of practice, curatorship is a form of practice. So if there's a lesson to be learned in all of this is that keep on doing the work as it were. I think the nomination of Leslie for the Reba medal is a huge testament to her achievements and her consistent battle to make Africa and its creativity and its adherence relevant worldwide. It's an incredible honor to be recognized by your peers. It's a very different form of recognition. So I would say three things. It's an incredible surprise, an incredible honor, and an incredible pleasure. She, probably more than anybody I can think of, has given people from all sorts of backgrounds, non-traditional backgrounds mainly, who might not have thought that the architecture profession would welcome them or that their voices would be heard, the confidence to believe that they really will be listened to and their voices really are, some, are valuable and that the profession is a better place with them at the table. And, and she has, with the African Future Institute and other things, shown us that you can change the way, the way we learn, the way we teach architecture, the way we, we think about architecture, um, the starting point for experimentation through identity and other, other modes. Um, and is that confidence to embrace change would be a legacy that Leslie would leave behind. But I think there's been a lot of talk about um, how what I do isn't architecture. And I think there's been an incredible shift over the last 10 years in the way people relate to the built environment. It was always very clear to me that there was a difference between the profession of architecture and the discipline of architecture. And I think in the last 10 years, we're beginning to see those two things come slightly closer together. The antagonism between teaching and practice, I think, is, is slowly beginning to dissolve. So I hope that this 
award will also make it clear that the divisions that we we inherit, that we construct, that we put upon ourselves between different aspects of our lives. Not that they don't matter, but perhaps they're not the first place that we should be looking when we're thinking about change and about moving forward. So I very much hope that this medal demonstrates that it's it's worth it to think differently, it's worth it to go off-piste or to go off the beaten track.